Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. We've got the CSI law and order effect where everybody thinks the goal of every conversation is to get the I did it. They can take a 15-year-old in, absent a parent, and absent a lawyer. They were convicted of murders despite DNA proving their innocence. Well, welcome to Fill in the Blanks. We're talking about something I think you will find very interesting today. Many people don't know that the police are permitted to outright lie about evidence to someone they bring into the station for questioning. They are even permitted to lie to minors, even kids. Now try explaining that to parents. My guests today have firsthand knowledge of this and are here to share their experience and expertise. Laura Nyrider is a clinical professor of law and co-director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law in Chicago. Now, Laura represents individuals who were wrongfully convicted of crimes when they were children or teenagers. Her clients have included Brendan Dassey, whose case was profiled in the Netflix global series Making a Murderer, and Damian Eccles, of the West Memphis Three, whose case was profiled in the documentary West of Memphis. Dave Thompson is the president of Wicklander Zulowski and Associates, Inc. He is also a leader in non-confrontational interview and interrogation training. Now, he doesn't want to demonize police in any way, and like me, is a supporter of law enforcement. But there are some that abuse the system. Dave incorporated evidence-based investigative interrogation, which focuses on building genuine rapport, asking open-ended questions, and using academic research to train for investigative interviews. Together, they have a collaboration that, let's face it, is a bit unexpected. A defense lawyer and a law enforcement trainer, which they will also tell us about. So, Laura, Dave, welcome to Fill in the Blanks. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely a unique partnership, but one that I think we both both grown through that collaboration in the process. Well, let's talk about how this came about, because frankly, a defense lawyer and someone that works on the police side of interrogation and training police officers on interrogation, these are not birds of a feather usually. So the two of you together, which I love, by the way, And we've worked together before. We've been on the show, the three of us. And I found both of you provocative and informative. But how did this come about, the two of you together? Well, I'll let Dave uh, Dave tell the story, but you know it's it's just been one of the most incredible partnerships. And you're right; it's not every day that a defense attorney comes along and you know becomes a close colleague of of somebody who's dedicated to training law enforcement. So I like to think. uh, of our evolution here as, as, as a way to build bridges and come together on some really important issues, wrongful convictions. You know, no one wants the, the wrong person convicted. Everybody wants the right person, right, to be taken off the streets while the innocents get to go home at night. So I think that's the foundation for this. And, and Dave, you can tell the, the story of what uh, introduced us to each other's work. Yeah. And I think there's probably no better time to talk about, about this. I mean, we're in such a divisive society right now, whether it's politics, criminal justice, or, or any kind of reform. And, um, you know, the simple way to put this, and you mentioned Brendan Dassey's name earlier, like most people, I sat and watched Making a Murderer and binge watched it over a weekend several several years ago. And um, I saw the interrogations of Brendan Dassey. And I have the wonderful opportunity to work for an organization that has a platform of teaching law enforcement. And so when I saw what happened there, I kind of recognized that if if we don't say anything, that's just as good as us blessing and recognizing that that technique was permissible and it's a reliable confession. I didn't believe that. So I had the chance to reach out to Laura and some others involved in the case. And uh, from there, I realized that we're really not on two different sides of the same argument. We're really on, on the same one. We're, we're looking to make sure law enforcement has effective tools to solve cases and protect public safety. And I think we've actually seen more 
uh, that we have in common, then we actually have a part throughout this partnership. Well, I think you do too. And I said some of this when we've talked before, but I really worry sometimes about the government and in this situation, prosecutors who do become abusive. I mean that at several different levels, but as I've said before, I think they forget what their job is, and their job is to seek justice, not a conviction. I think sometimes they get into a case and they get involved ego-wise and time-wise and career-wise. They get bought in and they go after a conviction as opposed to a just conviction. So they'll do virtually anything to get that conviction once they start down that path, whether it's just or not. And I can't believe that some of these prosecutors don't know when they've gone past the line and say, I've taken liberties here in getting a confession. I've taken liberties here in getting someone to say something that a reasonable, rational interrogation in the bright light of day with proper support in place would never have been given. Is that a fair statement or am I being too critical? I I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on. I mean, I think that, you know, tunnel vision is a real thing that sets in, Dr. Phil, when you are in, you know, the position of, of prosecuting somebody, of telling a story about what it is they did. You know, I think it can be real easy for that tunnel vision to set in and and make no mistake, right? I mean, all of us are vulnerable to that. All of us get wedded to our own narratives. There's no question about that. And that's why I think this partnership that Dave and I have forged has been so incredibly valuable because we can serve as as checks on each other. We can bounce ideas off each other. Am I getting too much, you know, in my own place of tunnel vision here, right? Um, So those are the conversations we have all the time that are so useful as we as we think about moving forward. Right. And you mentioned, Dr. Phil, the prosecutor perspective here. And I think it's important to see how that trickles down to the detective. Right. I like what you said. You know, their goal is to seek justice, not a conviction. And when we look at the interview or the interrogation, the goal should be how do I obtain actionable intelligence versus a confession? And it's that mindset shift of let's get rid of this presumption of guilt. And instead, let's enter a conversation with the goal of let me obtain as much information as possible so that we can further investigate. But, you know, we've got this kind of uh, CSI law and order effect where everybody thinks the goal of every conversation is to get the I did it. And in fact, that's that promotes the tunnel vision that Laura just spoke about. Hi, this is Rachel Yucatel, and I'm here to invite you to listen to my podcast, Misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. This podcast delves into the lives of those who have been reduced to a single headline. Each episode will take a closer look at the stories of those who are on a mission to change their narrative. Join me as we uncover the truth behind the misconceptions, shed light on the stories of those who have perhaps been wrongfully portrayed, explore the complexities of the human experience, and celebrate the power of second chances. Who doesn't love a good comeback story? I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. But we're not. Not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Okay, let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> I'm always concerned when you look at the evidence and you see there are interrogation methods that are long embraced and used by probably the vast majority of interrogators. They include certain things such as lying to a suspect, misrepresenting evidence, things that have been constitutionally protected in many ways. Those same things are used with sophisticated, intelligent suspects, all the way down to those that are intellectually challenged. And when we look at the number of false confessions that lead to wrongful convictions, it goes up dramatically when you use those techniques with those that are less equipped to recognize and fend them off. 
versus those that are equipped to recognize and fend them off, which tells you that it's not a level playing field. If you have someone that's got an ADIQ and no support system and you use those techniques, you're going to get two, three, four times as many false confessions as you do with a sophisticated suspect. So they have to know that they have tipped the playing field. Uh, well, I agree uh, completely. And I think when you, you meant the first thing you mentioned, Dr. Phil, is the if there's if there's one kind of technique or traditional training, when when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And when you think about investigators that are they're going to talk to a witness, a victim, a potential suspect, regardless of age, um, or all the other vulnerabilities that could make risk factors. If, if they're only trained in one technique, that's the only thing they're going to use. And we like to look back and instead of always faulting the officer is what, what tools were they given in the first place to be successful? And what we're seeing now are things like trauma informed interviewing to recognize people that have been exposed to trauma, how that impacts their memory and their recall. Uh, we're looking at the social science of, you know, when we say juvenile or youth, you know, now we're looking at up, upwards towards the age of 25, not traditionally 18. And I think the more we know that we can educate investigators on, they want to do the right thing, but we need to provide them the tools to do so. I mean, I think that's one of the most important things that, that you're doing, Dave, and that we're doing in partnership. The, the amazing thing is, I think most people don't know that police are allowed to lie to kids during interrogations, much less that police have been trained to do just that, you know, this is being taught in all 50 states to our police officers, right? To our law enforcement that's out there on the streets. Uh, they're being taught to use these techniques. And, uh, you know, the history here is, is fascinating to me. These techniques in which we deceive and, and manipulate people during interrogation. You know, these techniques were invented way back in the 1940s and 1950s, and they have gone untouched. They are still in use today. Even though now that DNA has been invented, we're realizing that people are falsely confessing due to this manipulation so much more often than anyone would ever have thought. So it, we're at this moment now of realization, thanks to DNA technology, that these old, outdated techniques, it's, it's time to get rid of them and, and do something new. Well, I couldn't agree more, but let me ask you something. I think I am misinformed or made a wrong assumption about this. But in all 50 states, and I know the laws vary, and they tend to follow generally the federal guidelines, is it legal for interrogators to question a minor absent a parent? In most states, that is legal. Now, most states require police when they want to question your kid to at least try to notify the parents. Right. But a, a, a slim, slim minority of states require the parent to actually be there. I think only 13 states require the parent to actually be there. So in most states, you know, the police, if they come to your kid's school, they want to question your kid. They pick up the phone. They try to reach you. It goes to voicemail. They can check the box. They've satisfied their duty and they can take your child and interrogate them without ever having actually spoken to you. So they can take a 15 year old in absent a parent and absent a lawyer, if the kid doesn't request a lawyer or demand a lawyer, they can Mirandize that kid, lie to that kid about, hey, I'm going to read you your rights, but you're not in trouble here, and then interrogate a child who doesn't even understand the concept of making an admission against interest, doesn't understand what constitutes a violation of the law, doesn't understand what implicating him or herself in a crime might be whose brain is not even almost finished growing and therefore can't predict the consequences of their actions and interrogate that person for hours on end, get a confession and say, okay, we're wrapped here, cuff them and cage them. You got it. You got it. Hundreds and hundreds of cases like that around the country where this happens the child ends up, you know, like you say, not understanding what their rights are in the room. What kid you know understands what exactly a right to a lawyer means or what a lawyer could do for them in that moment? You know, I mean, 85 percent of people waive their Miranda rights. And that number gets even higher when you're talking about kids. Pretty soon, you know, you got a kid who's who's being told falsely 
that there's a bunch of evidence against them. You've got a kid who's being told falsely that if they confess, right, they'll, they'll go home. But if they don't confess, they'll go to prison. And all of a sudden, you've got a kid who is prone to saying things, saying they did things that maybe never happened at all. You see, we socialized kids to respect adults, to respect authority, to respect the police. And so they come in and say, okay, listen, here's what we know, and we're not focused on you. We just need to know what happened. And the kid may not understand conspiracy, may not understand any of the aspects or the elements of the crime, hasn't seen a jury charge ever, doesn't have any concept of what the test of the law is and can make admissions against interest without understanding what he's admitting to or she is admitting to. That just seems to me to be such an unfair playing field. Well, let me give you some good news. Um, We've had five states in the last uh, year and a half or so pass legislation that ascent, they're all a little different, but essentially makes these confessions uh, inadmissible with juveniles if deception is used. And and the reason I think that that's important is all the way back to 2012, the International Association of Chiefs of Police came out with a recommendation, a policy recommendation, that you shouldn't use this, this tactic, lying, to our youth as a policy. And as we know, culture eats policy for breakfast. So um, we haven't seen a lot of departments implement that. But in the last few years, what we're seeing are departments take a stance on educating their investigators on how do we handle interviews with youthful uh, offenders, witnesses, suspects differently than we did before. So we're seeing legislative policy, we're seeing training being different, and we're seeing social science brought into the, to the training room. Well, when I was at Courtroom Sciences, we ran as many as 10,000 mock jurors and respondents to venue surveys, all different kinds of things in a year. And one of the things I frequently ask them is, do you believe that, generally speaking, people would admit to a crime they didn't commit? And overwhelmingly, they said absolutely not. They just cannot conceive that somebody would admit to a crime they didn't commit. So they have a preconceived notion that if they said they did it, they did it. People just don't admit to something they didn't do. So if you get a confession, that weighs heavy on the jury. There's no question in my mind about that. But the truth of the matter is we're seeing, as you say, Laura, over and over, that that's just simply not the case. Well, the cases that'll floor you and I think are a great illustration of your point, Dr. Phil, are these cases in which, you know, you, you bring a kid, a teenager into the interrogation room, they're questioned for hours using deceptive tactics, no parent, no lawyer, kid is scared, kid offers up a story finally because he thinks that's what he needs to do, offers up a confession. Um, this has happened in Chicago all the time, actually in a couple of cases most recently that I've worked on, uh, the Dix Moore Five and the Englewood Four, groups of teenagers actually were brought in and confessed to murders uh, in these two separate cases. And what's amazing about these cases is that you've got kids confessing to these murders. And in both cases, before trial, the DNA evidence from the crime scene was tested and it excluded every single one of these kids. These kids were ghosts at those crime scenes. They just weren't there. But because they had confessed, in a courtroom, in front of a jury, at the end of the day, they were convicted of these murders, despite DNA proving their innocence, because they'd confessed. That's how potent this evidence is. That's how powerful this belief, this myth, right, is that no one would confess to a crime they didn't commit. How is that not prosecutorial misconduct? Because the jury might not understand all of the nuance of that. But the prosecutor damn sure does. The medical examiner damn sure does. And the judge certainly does. 
We've all seen the headlines in the news of how someone lost their life in an act of cold-blooded murder. And while it's sad and grabs your attention, most people go on with their day without giving it another thought. But have you ever stopped to think about the life of the person at the center of the news story? They were more than just a headline or a statistic. They were someone's loved one or friend. I'm Mike Morford, and my podcast, The Murder of My Family, dives into some of those stories to help listeners get to know the person who was lost and how their death affected those closest to them. Listen to The Murder of My Family everywhere you listen to podcasts. There are well over 100 episodes to binge on now. I'm Dr. Megan Sachs. And I'm Dr. Amy Sloshberg. And we're the host of the podcast Campus Killings. Our show covers some of the most sinister crimes to take place on or around school campuses. Or the cases we discuss have a school-connected theme. And with the new school year comes an all-new second season of Campus Killings, which will debut on September 16th, 2023. But if you want to listen to Campus Killings now, you can binge all the episodes from season one. Available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Well, I think you're right. And I think that, you know, part of what we're doing here, frankly, today, and what you've been doing, Dr. Phil, on your show in covering these wrongful conviction cases is shining a light on the fact that we need to educate and reform so many different parts of this system. You know, I speak around the world about false confessions and police interrogations and wrongful convictions and juvenile justice. And turns out, you know, a lot of prosecutors don't understand about false confessions. A lot of defense attorneys don't understand about false confessions. So you got lawyers out there saying, I took a case, this kid confessed, I'm done. There's nothing I can do to help. You know, we speak to judges, we speak to police officers, uh, we speak to ordinary everyday folks who, you know, thank God get this stuff. Because once you see it, you know, once you hear these stories, once you see a video of an interrogation, you really don't have to be a lawyer to understand just how easy it would be for a kid to falsely confess. Yeah, those the stories are what really inspired inspired me and helps us in our in our training is when you hear it directly from somebody in that position, your your question about how do you educate people on why would somebody falsely confess? It's it's about storytelling and for the for the listeners, it's about imagining if your child was picked up for for question by law enforcement for anything what would you want them to do, right? You'd, you'd expect your child to tell the truth. And if they attempt to tell the truth, but the investigator doesn't accept it and tells them, no, that, that can't be what happened, maybe lies to him and says, we have witnesses that put you at the scene or we have f- your fingerprints there. But what would you want your child to do? And, and for the people that are listening, not every child has the capacity to call mom or dad or, to, or the funding to call an attorney or the maybe societal awareness that they even have one. And when you think about when we educate law enforcement, as soon as an investigator is ever questioned by internal affairs, they're asking for a union rep mm-hmm. or they're asking for, you know, they're asking for representation. And so it's just put yourself in the in the mindset of the 15 year old, regardless of the crime they may or may not have committed. They're still 15 and understanding what what capacity they might actually have is important. Yeah, of course, I've had friends when I was in high school that they'd rather face the judge than their parents. <laughs> <It's> like, <Right. laughs> hey, you, know, you want to call right. your parents? No. <laughs> no, put me under the jail, but don't call my dad. But let me ask you this, and this is kind of a rhetorical question, but I guess I'm asking what's the remedy? When you see a prosecutor that gets an alibi, a denial, or whatever, and it's riddled with inconsistencies, they just tear it apart. They set up a chronological timeline. They come back with all the contradictory evidence and information how long they were somewhere, how long it would have taken them to get somewhere. They just blow it up. Then those same investigators get a confession that's riddled with the same amount of inconsistencies. You know, say they were stabbed instead of drowned or shot them instead of choked them or whatever, and said they came in through a window when they know that the person came in through the door or whatever all of these inconsistencies, and they just gloss over them. What's the research say about what they're telling themselves to ignore inconsistencies in a confession that they would tear apart in a denial? I think you're explaining confirmation bias pretty pretty well there. I mean, it's this presumption of guilt, which is obviously counterintuitive to our entire legal system. Uh, But when we look at a, at a false confession or a wrongful conviction, the catalyst to what you're describing is what's called misclassification, is what, what put an innocent person 
in that seat in the first place? And and why were they presumed guilty, which is wrong? And what we look back now is we see faulty forensic evidence, bite mark evidence. We see um, eyewitness testimony, one of the leading causes of wrongful convictions. We see jailhouse informants, snitches, again, another leading cause of wrongful convictions. And so an investigator who should do their due diligence is maybe ill-informed as to why somebody's a suspect in the first place and then and then gets this confirmation bias that if they look guilty and smell guilty and act guilty in their mind, they must be guilty and they and they refuse to accept anything else. And that's a problem. I think that's a very generous explanation. Yeah. Because <laughs> you can't tell me that if somebody knows somebody was stabbed 37 times oh, yeah. and somebody says, well, yeah, I, I I choked them with a dish towel and then stabbed them in the leg and they bled out and they know they were stabbed 37 times. That's beyond confirmation bias. That's negligence, right? Intentionally. Well, and it's, it's willful blindness. You know, one of the things that is, was fascinating to me when I started learning about how interrogation works is, you know, when those interrogators walk into the room, right? They are very often taught that you don't interrogate in order to figure out if the person is guilty. You only interrogate after you believe them to be guilty. So the, the goal of interrogation is not to, you know, figure out whether you did it. It's to get a statement from you admitting that you did it. And so if that's the goal, right, if the goal is, OK, let's just get him or her to incriminate themselves. You know, I think that, that for way too long, folks have been willing to accept statements that are wildly inaccurate about the way the crime happened because the goal has just been to get them to say something that makes them sound guilty. And that's why we got to change those goals. And I think, and you, I know Dr. Philly said, what's the remedy? I think one of the things, doesn't fix the problem, but it creates transparency, is recording of the interrogation. Because all too often that, that end confession is the only thing that a judge or jury sees. And that might be accurate. But it may have taken 30 variations of that story to become accurate. And if, if we don't see how that transpired, it looks like a reliable confession when, in fact, it's the result of fact feeding and altering of a story for the last two hours in the room. So recording doesn't fix it, but at least provides transparency to how we got there. And we saw that with Brendan Dassey. Clearly, this was a confession by successive approximation. Well, what do you do to her head. What did he do? And finally just tells him and it says, well, why didn't you tell me that? We didn't tell him that because he didn't know. That's right. That's right. Here you've got a a 16-year-old 10th grade special education student, right, who is pulled into the police station. He's interrogated four times over a period of 48 hours, three of those times with no parent present, four of those times with no lawyer present. And you've got this kid (laughs) who is told that he's going to be charged with murder unless he starts filling in the blanks of what the interrogators think happened. And he starts guessing because he's scared. And this whole thing's on tape, right? All these interrogations are on tape. And and you can just watch his story, you know, reflect what the interrogators are telling him. And they get to this point, the most important point, right? This is a murder case. The most important point of this whole interrogation is, did you... Did you kill her? And if so, how? Right. And, and the interrogators know that she had been killed by being shot in the head. So that's what they're looking for Brendan, for this, this special education student to say. So they, they say to him on, on tape, right, how was she killed? And this is one of the most unbelievable sequences of any interrogation tape I have ever seen. Because here's this, this 16-year-old and he, he says, did we stab her? No, no, no. Something else, Brendan, something else they say. What else? We choked her. No, something else, something else. And he goes through this whole guessing game of of ways to kill someone. At one point, he's so confused. You know, they have to start giving him hints. They say to him, Brendan, um, it's something with the head. You did something with the head. And he's so confused. He says, we we cut off her hair. (laughs) And this goes on and on and on. It's just painful to watch. Until he gives up, he says, I can't, I can't think of anything more. At which point they have to say to him, they have to tell him the right answer. They say to him, Brendan, I'm just going to come out and ask you who shot her in the head. And he says, oh, well, that was, that was my uncle. 
right, who was also there uh, in this story. And they said, why, why didn't you just tell us that, right? Why are you rattling off all these other things? Why didn't you just tell us that? And Brendan looks up and he says, because I couldn't think of it. He's guessing. When I saw that initially, I just thought, why didn't they just write it out and tell him he was signing his release paper and have him sign it? It would have been just as valid. Why didn't they have him confess to, you know, shooting Elvis on the moon while they're at it? You know, I mean, it's just they could have gotten him to say anything in those moments, I think, pretty much anything at all. Dave, what did you think about that when you saw it? Well, that moment and actually the, another moment shortly after that, and Laura, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if the jury saw, but when um, Brenda's mom enters the room and he, you know, immediately starts to recant, essentially, and the pressure has been relieved from him and he, he's asking if he can go back to school. Like, clearly, you can see that Brendan has no idea what he just acknowledged. He has no idea what just happened. He doesn't think there's any consequences to it. And he tells his mom right away, they got to my head. And that that's the part that just sh- struck with me. And I'll also tell you that these video clips that we're talking about, um, we've shown these clips to over 50,000 investigators the last several years as examples of how not to conduct interviews. And regardless if you have a- an innocent or a guilty person in the room, when you contaminate an interview, the way that we just, that Laura just described, it removes any reliability to that admission, right? How are we supposed to identify this person as being truthful or not? We just told them everything they're supposed to say. So I I think it's just a a prototype of a false and unreliable confession. Well, if I'd have been the chief and I saw that and I thought that Brendan Dassey was guilty, I swear I would have fired the interrogators saying, you just blew this case. Instead of getting a legitimate confession, you just fed him a confession, and now we have nothing. When I saw that, I thought, A, there's no way they can sustain any kind of action against him, and B, they'll never use it against Stephen Avery because you can't use fruit from the poison tree to get a conviction against somebody else. Right, and I think it it goes back to to this training piece going forward is when an investigator's primary goal of that of that interview or interrogation is to get a confession, it results in what we just saw there is they're going to accept nothing else other than I did it. Again, regardless of innocence or guilt, if your goal is let me get as much information that I can compare to the actual evidence, we can actually investigate. And the last thing I'll say with this, we've been talking a lot about deceptive tactics. The, the Supreme Court ruling that permitted the use of this tactic is from 1969. Uh, the availability of evidence is a little bit different today than it was back in the early 70s. And we have the ability to to do, we can track a whole bunch of stuff we weren't even thinking about, you know, 50 years ago. And so it, it's just, it's not relevant anymore. It doesn't need to be used anymore. And we can actually have investigators investigate would be, would be part of the solution. Well, I work with law enforcement as well, doing training and all. And I've been asked over the years so many times, is Stephen Avery guilty and is Brendan Dassey guilty? I've given the same answer every time, and that is, all I can tell you for sure is that neither one has ever had a fair trial. Don't know if they did or didn't. I can tell you what I think, what I know, is they've never had a fair trial. Well, look, I can speak only as Brendan's lawyer, but I've represented Brendan Dassey for 15 years now. And my work on his case and getting to know this young man who was 17 when I met him, he is 33 years old now. I am so proud to represent Brendan Dassey. The only evidence connecting him to this murder is this confession we're talking about, where he's not even able to describe what happened. You know, I mean, every citizen who cares about truth, who cares about due process, who cares about reliability in our criminal justice system, should be jumping off their couches and, you know, rushing out there to make sure that this doesn't happen again, not to Brendan, not to any other special education student, not to any other kid, not to any of us, right? The way the system let that boy, now man, down is just heartbreaking. Uh, Laura Laura provided the opportunity for us a few weeks ago to to chat with Brendan. And uh, just, I think it's important for me to be able to to say how kind and uh, inspiring 
Brandon Dassey is. And I can't imagine anybody I've talked to. I know we had uh, Terrell Swift on your show. Anybody I've talked to that's been kind of a victim of this process, it just amazes me the hope and the positivity and the focus that they have uh, because they know who they are and they know what they did or did not do. And just Brendan, just one of the most, the positive, most inspirational piece of this whole puzzle, I think. Yeah. You know, he's, he's 33, as I said, and you know, Brendan has, I've watched him grow up and he's grown up into this unbelievably kind, you know, gentle, funny person who still has, he still has this childlike faith that one day justice is going to come for him. You know, it's remarkable. After making a murder, all these people around the globe, millions and millions of people saw his story. They started writing Brendan letters, right? From all over the globe. You'd get these letters. He still gets like five or 10 letters every day. Really? From ordinary people who just, you know, it's nothing profound or eloquent, who just put down on a piece of paper, hey, Brendan, you know, Hang in there. I'm thinking of you. I believe in you. Hold your head up high. You know, the truth is going to come out. This kind of stuff. He, he still gets these letters every day. He keeps them. And he writes back to as many people as he can, you know, given his limitations. He writes back to as many people as he can because those, those letters, you know, finding their way to his prison cell in rural Wisconsin, some from Australia, some from, you know, the other side of the country, some from just down the street in Wisconsin. Those letters give him an enormous amount of hope. Lord, what is next for him, and what's it going to take for him to get released, get reconsideration, get a fair trial? What's it going to take? It's going to take courage, Dr. Phil. It's going to take courage. You know, if someone in Brendan's position legally right now, um, the best option is to go to the governor of Wisconsin and seek executive clemency, in this case, a commutation which means a cutting short of a sentence, essentially an act that would free him. So that's all that's left? That's Brendan's um, you know, best option right now by, by a mile. So right now we are in a process of education, of collaboration, you know, reaching out to folks around the state of Wisconsin. Hey, have you heard about Brendan Dassey? Come talk to someone like Dave, right? A, a law enforcement authority who knows what he saw when he saw those tapes, who's shown those tapes to 50,000 cops around the country to train them. Um, you know, come and, come and just sit down with us, talk with us, watch this video, meet Brendan. And, uh, you know, I guarantee once you approach this case with an open mind, there's only one right, decent thing to do, which is free Brendan Dassey. And what is his sentence right now? He was sentenced to life in prison with the first possibility of parole in 2048 when he will be 59 Ugh. years old. 2048. That's right. That's right. Good God. You know, and one of the amazing things, Dr. Phil, is because of all these problems with his case that we're talking about, during his trial, when he was on trial back in 2007, the prosecutors actually offered him what they call a mercy plea. No strings attached. Just say you did it. We'll give you 15 years in prison. Don't have to testify. Nothing. Just, just say you did it 15 years. He said, no, I didn't do it. I want to go to trial. I want to get through this trial. I want to prove my innocence. Now, because he went to trial and was convicted because people don't understand why someone would falsely confess, right? Right. Now he's got life in prison. He's done way more than 15 years. He's coming up on 17 years now. Yeah, he would be out. That's right. That's right. But he stuck to his principles and it landed him a life sentence. Wow. That's sad. Nobody knows. But like I said, what I know for absolute certain is he has never had a fair trial and he certainly hasn't had a fair shake. I'm having lunch this afternoon with Marty Tankliffe. I worked on his case back when he was still in on trying to get him out. And as you know, he was exonerated. Yeah. Got out, became an attorney, uh, is now adjunct professor at Georgetown and works on just these kind of cases and has a family. And you just hope when you give people the chance they deserve, you see what happens. It's just astounding to me. No, it's what you were saying before, you know, the resilience that these folks show and, and the, the humanity that 
that we're locking up wrongfully in these cases. Marty's a great example. You know, Dave, you know Marty as well as I do. Yeah, Marty's again another example of an inspiration. He's helped testify in some of these uh, legislative hearings to get policy change. He's been he's been a great support. Um, and I, and I think, you know, if we could go on just real quick back to Brendan's case, and you know, I mentioned we use some of these examples in our in our training, among other other cases and examples. I tell Marty's story all the time. Most, if not all, investigators identify the same thing when they watch these tapes. And I don't know the investigators that were involved in, in Brendan's case. I don't know their mindset at the time. Uh, but any when I talk to investigators today, when they reflect back, I'm sure they wish they would have done things differently, even just because of the reliability or unreliability that comes from those statements and the approach that was used. And um, I think that's powerful. You know, we've got investigators across the globe that recognize there's an issue with the reliability of that information. And as Laura said, that's the information that was used to convict. And so we've got a simple math problem here. Yeah, that's shocking. So what is the solution? A lot of what is being done, I think it's generous to say that it's confirmation bias. I think it's generous to say that it's tunnel vision. I think that there's just a lot of, I don't care. I've got somebody in the box here and... My job's to get a conviction. I'm going to get a conviction. I've worked with so many of these prosecutors who have just told me straight up, I came over here, A, to get experience in front of a jury, and B, to build up a one-loss record, hopefully perfect, and then I'm going to jump to the defense side of the docket so I can then start recruiting these cases and say, hey, I was a prosecutor. I was your worst nightmare. I never lost a case. I know how to beat these cases because I've been on the other side. I think they've got an agenda. Some of these guys have an agenda. And then they're going to jump to the other side of the docket and try to get rich off of it. I think there's more larceny in their hearts than just simple confirmation bias. But what do we do? How do we fix this? What does the legislation need to call for? Well, I can speak to the to the law enforcement piece of this. Um, You know, there's a a slide I have in our PowerPoint that says if it if it ain't broke, break it. And part of the first thing that we have to do when we're training investigators is identify they've used techniques for the last several decades that in their mind have been successful because they have successfully solved some some cases. And so the first thing we have to do is educate what all of these potential tactics are that can be a a problem. The second thing we have to do in conjunction with that is provide education on what training does work. Um, You know, about almost a a year ago now, my hometown of Buffalo, New York, we had a a shooting, a racist attack at a grocery store. Sentencing was just about a week ago. We had 10 people in our community were killed. And if you have to go interview the witnesses to a shooting, you, you can't be relying on these deceptive tactics or assuming how they're going to respond. You need to understand how trauma impacts those witnesses. And the same thing applies in all of these cases is uh, providing a tool for investigators to go get information from a legislative piece. The last the last third piece of this remedy is making sure not only policy and a department reflects new training, making sure that's bought in from the command staff top down, making sure the prosecutor's office knows what a reliable confession looks like. And if all that doesn't work and it hasn't, we have to know that about 30% of wrongful convictions contained a false confession, which means about 30% of these had confessions that were admitted by the courts as voluntary. And so the important piece of legislation is to provide the courts a screening tool to identify if all else fails, this shouldn't be used as evidence uh, in, a, in a conviction against a potentially innocent person. So I think those are the, at least the, the three prongs that we're working on on this side. You know, I just throw one other thing into the mix here that I think another thing that surprises people, ordinary people, is the idea of prosecutorial immunity and police immunity. You know, I mean, for those of us who are just, you know, doing our jobs, living our lives, you, you, you make a big mistake at your job or if you do something intentionally wrong, at your job, you know, all of us can be held liable. People can sue us, right? I can get sued as a lawyer for malpractice. We can all get sued in different ways, held accountable uh, for, for the things that we do wrong. But what's wild is that for police and prosecutors, it's not the same, right? They have been carved out of that system and given special immunity so that if you are a prosecutor and let's say you are a bad guy and you decide to intentionally frame someone, 
for murder, knowing that they're innocent, right? The worst of the worst of the worst things you can do. Send them away to prison for life or maybe to death row. And you do this on purpose. You cannot be held liable under the law because of immunity, right? And and police officers have qualified immunity that act to protect them, even if they do things intentionally wrong. And I think that's a huge part of the system that's got to be fixed too. We can all be held accountable to each other. And there's no reason to take a couple of groups of professions, police prosecutors, and treat them different than doctors or teachers or, you know, other important people with important responsibilities in our society. Yeah, I think we're all three saying the same thing. Think about how many interrogations go on, how many interviews or interrogations, however somebody approaches it, go on every day. I think the vast majority of them don't have ill intent. I think they're trying to get to the truth, get to the bottom, find out what happened and hold the right people accountable. I'm a huge supporter of law enforcement from the bottom to the top. But man, when you get something that goes awry, I think depriving someone of their liberty in the United States is a very high standard and it should be. Depriving someone of their life is the highest of high standards and well, it should be. There's got to be some kind of standard, some kind of review, check and balance system here. And having spent so much time in the litigation arena, I've told my staff here, if you get stopped, you get in juxtaposition to some crime, you don't want to say anything about anything to law enforcement. You need to get a lawyer and don't say anything. What advice do you guys give to your friends off the record if there's been a shooting, an incident, a bad car wreck, something that they're even tangentially involved with, what do you tell people when the police show up? How do you tell them to conduct themselves? I'll answer that because I think it's unique from my perspective. Call an attorney. And I think the same thing happens. I think police officers that we train tell their family the same thing because even by saying, obviously, be respectful and cooperate, which makes sense, but cooperate is part of the problem, right? Because we all we all perceive what cooperate means differently. If that's starting to give up information that you don't realize is going to incriminate yourself, even if incidentally is, is an obstacle. And even with kids, so parents that are listening, parents are often the worst person to be in the room with their child during an interview. Uh, they don't, they're not giving good legal advice. They could be victim of the same technique. So um, you have the right to representation, use it. No question about it. You know, I'm a mom. I've got two little boys in school. And one advice I give, you know, my mom friends out there is put a letter on file with your, with your kid's principal at their school saying, you know what, if, if a police officer shows up at school, wants to question my, my child, right? This child, I am asserting for them their right to a lawyer in this letter. They have representation. I will get them representation. I do not want them questioned without me and, and without a lawyer. Wow. What good advice right there from both of you. And I hadn't thought about the letter Dave, I agree with you 100%. I've had cases where someone has died in the home and the spouse's parent has shown up to support and they just took them to the police station as witnesses, not as suspects, and listened to them talk. The spouse says, just feeling guilty, says, oh my God, I just feel horrible I just blame myself. That was the beginning of them winding up in prison and ultimately committing suicide. And it began with them saying to their parent, I blame myself. That's terrible. And they didn't mean I caused the death. It's just, I should have been there. I should have, you know, been more sensitive. I should have seen this coming. I should have. You know how you self-recriminate when you didn't foresee something, and they wound up in prison and couldn't take it, and both of the children wound up without a parent because one was dead and the other killed himself in prison. And it all started with, I blame myself. I think we see the same. It's a a terrible, but a a good example of that. I think we see the same often with uh, wrongful death of a child or child abuse or teachers, parents, caretakers that 
that feel this guilt and remorse and they're in this kind of state of trauma after something happened. And those types of spontaneous utterances can be easily misconstrued or used in the wrong, in the wrong way. So I think that's, that's really, really important advice. Yeah. And as we know, admission against interest is a exception to the hearsay rule. So they can use that and you're screwed. I just tell them, don't say a word. It's too bad because I think that so many of these people that are the detectives, the investigators are out there really trying to figure out what really happened. And the bad thing is when you get a false confession and you can fix the wrong person, that means the wrongdoer is still out on the street. Yeah. And I think part of, part of that is, you know, for you asked for advice for maybe parents or listeners, but the law enforcement folks that are listening or those that have a phone and want to want to call and see how their department's training when you look at investigators right now, they most departments maybe annually or biannually, they have to get qualified on how to shoot a weapon, how to fire a weapon. They have to get trained and certified on use of force, on a taser, on how to drive their vehicle. Um, but for interview and interrogation, which is we're talking about this whole this whole session here and how powerful that is, it's often go to a two or three day class or learn on the job and one class for 20 year career, you're good. And what we need is more required mandated education and accountability when people aren't compliant with it, just like every other task that they have on the job. And because we're now seeing how powerful these tools are when they're used improperly. Yeah, people don't know the psychological subtleties of this and what's going on. We know psychologically, if you can keep somebody from making a denial, if they start to make a denial and you can stop them short. Even if you just jump in and say their name, if they start to say, I didn't, Dave, let me ask you something else. If you can just stop them, they're a lot more likely to ultimately confess if you don't let them dig a hole and they have a face-saving way out. There are so many subtleties that people don't understand. And if they're using all of those things to back somebody into a corner, if you're a civilian, you can't know what all is going on in there. You need to have a lawyer and you need to zip it. You never have to talk to them ever, ever, correct? If you are charged with a crime, you never have to give an interview or a statement. Correct. That's exactly right. You never need to, you, and you should not do it. Instead, you ask for that lawyer. Yeah. You know, hope somebody comes and files a civil suit before you have to go to trial and you get some discovery because you don't ever have to say doodly squat. <laughs> <laughs> that just doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. Well, guys, I really appreciate you taking time to talk about this because if enough people hear us, if enough people pay attention to this, A, maybe we can change people from thinking innocent people don't confess because that's just not true. And we've proven that with the advancement of DNA technology where it's not a question. We see that it does happen time and time and time again, and it happens more and more with people that are less equipped to fight back against the techniques. And maybe we can get people to not be so close-minded about that. And maybe we can contribute to the catalyst for changing the techniques that are being used. I think when people commit bad crimes, they should be held accountable to the full extent of the law. But let's make sure we've got the right people. Well, amen. I agree with that 100 percent. Let's make sure we got the right people. And you are absolutely right. You know, this is a moment of education. I think people are listening now, questioning the way things have done, maybe opening their minds after they, they're you know watching shows like yours and hearing stories like these. And there is a better way forward. There's a path forward that will let us make sure the, the, the right people are locked up and the right people are free. And that's why you know, we're so glad to be collaborating with you, Dr. Phil and you know Dave, why I just take my, my hat off to the good work that you've been doing with law enforcement here, learning from these stories to make sure they don't happen again. Yeah. And positive from the law enforcement side. Uh, there's a lot of good news out there. There's a lot of major cities, major departments that have already adopted, you know, investigative interviewing techniques, already recording everything, have specialized interviewers for juveniles, have trauma informed interview training. So there's a lot of departments that have acknowledged this and command staff that are doing the right thing. So slow and steady, we're getting there, but there is some positive trends out there. Well, there certainly are. And again, my hat's off. We've got 800,000 plus men and women who put that uniform on every day and step into the gap to keep the rest of us safe. I support them. My hat's off to them and God bless them for doing what they do. And 
I support them enough to be able to acknowledge when certain things need to change to make it even better. I don't have to turn a blind eye to it because I support them enough that I can admit when there are certain things that need to change. And this is one of those things that need to change. I'm working on Richard Glossop's case in Oklahoma. And that poor guy has had his final meal four times. His final meal four times. And they're still trying to kill this guy. And I've got, I think it's 19 state senators and congressmen up there who are pro-capital punishment who say he should be turned loose. They say, yeah, we're pro-capital punishment. We just want to be sure we're executing the right person. We're pro-capital punishment. We just don't think he's the one. So they've come out and said, turn him loose, and we still can't get him turned loose. But we're working on it. We're working hard on it. And I'm going to continue to fight for those that I think are unjustly in prison and on death row. I'm going to fight, fight, fight till my last breath. And God bless you guys for what you're doing. And if I can help in any way, I'll write letters. I'll make phone calls. I'll come stand up for you, whatever. Just let me know. Thank thank you. you. And thanks for this platform. Thank you very much. Uh, Well, we'll talk again soon. I'm sure you guys have done a great job of explaining this today. I think a lot of people understand things now that they didn't when we started talking. And I appreciate you being on the show. I appreciate you being here. And we'll talk again soon. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Dave.